right, hello everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Devin Lau, I'm the Assistant Director for Yale Center Beijing, uh, and I know that many of you guys are joining us from China, so a good evening uh, to you. Uh, I'm based in the US, so it's bright and early for me, um, and it's the middle of the day in uh, the UK, so uh, we've. this is probably one of the first events that we uh, had at least three nodes uh, uh, connected. Um, I know that we have a lot of people tuning in from around the world, but to have the speaker um, and an audience and the moderator all in different parts of the world is, is quite, uh, quite unique to, to the time that we're in. So um, before we get started, I, I just wanted to say uh, welcome to all of you guys that are joining us for the first time. Uh, a little bit about Yale Center Beijing. Uh, Yale Center Beijing was founded in uh, 2014. Uh, and the goal is to connect, uh, like we're doing today, uh, thought leaders from around the world uh, in order to discuss uh, the latest research and publications and ideas. Um, and we've covered you know, everything from philosophy to music to um, science. Um, and today we're doing a little bit of history, um, but we're also doing a very uh, expansive bit of history here. Um, and so it should be a very fun conversation. Um, for those of you guys that are able to, I, I will ask that uh, if you could turn on your webcams, that's always uh, fun so that uh, our speaker is not just speaking to a black screen um, with random names. Uh, it's always nice to see people. So if you're able to, um, that would be great. Um, and so with that, let me introduce our speaker today. Uh, Jeremy Black is a prolific author of over 100 books. Uh, I think almost 200 we were just discussing. Uh, covering British, European, and American political, diplomatic, and military history, as well as the history of the press, cartography, warfare, as we're going to discuss today, culture, and the very nature and use of history itself. Um, so quite an expansive list. Uh, he is Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Exeter, uh, where he's joining us from today in Exeter. Uh, and he's uh, studies, studied both at Oxford and Cambridge, uh, and has also taught at Durham and Exeter. He's lectured extensively around the world, uh, in Australia, Canada, uh, all throughout Europe, of course, um, and the US, uh, where he's also held visiting chairs at various institutions, including West Point. Um, today, he will be discussing his newest book from Yale University Press, uh, where he's worked often uh, with our press at Yale University. Uh, and today's book is A Short History of War. Uh, many of his books have been published um, by Yale University Press and are actually available in China um, for those of you guys that are tuning in and are interested. Um, uh, if you go to uh, jd.com, um, many of his books are available. So if after the uh, discussion, if you're interested in reading more, please do so. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to uh, Jeremy, it's all yours. Um, he'll do about a 20 minute or so talk um, introducing the book. And while he's giving his talk, please feel free to use the chat button on the bottom of your Zoom screen um, to uh, enter any questions that you may have. And then after his uh, talk, we will enter into a time of Q&A and I'll be uh, using the questions that are entered there to start off our conversation. All right. Right, thank you very much and uh, hello everybody. Um, what I want to try and do is to look not so much at the book, I mean, I mean people can read the book if they want to and don't have to if they don't want to, I want to look rather at the question of how best to study global military history, which is the topic I've chosen. And let's start off with what I hope is a given for those people listening, which is that the history of war and the history of military matters is important. People may not wish it to be important, that's another is issue, but it is important and it is not simply some epiphenomena which arises from other uh, dynamics in history, whether socioeconomic, sociological, geopolitical, but is actually both a product of other contexts and also has an independent and autonomous development. Now the question then arises as to how best to consider it. 
And I think it's fair to say, um, I'm speaking obviously in English under the auspices of, uh, of Yale, I think it's fair to say that one of the problems with the subject for much of its study is that it's been understood primarily in a kind of Eurocentric chronology, a Eurocentric analysis. Now, as we are aware, uh, I need hardly say this uh, to a Chinese audience, this has enormous number of deficiencies and disadvantages. It's not only that um, for most of history, the major powers on land were non-European uh, and indeed linked to that much of the conflict, confrontation, deterrence through force uh, and warfare has actually taken part outside the West. It is also that the analytical suppositions developed for Western military history and including the chronological uh, periods in time do not necessarily fit more generally. So that's point number one. And I tried, in fact, to address that in a Yale book that came out in the mid 90s called War and the World 1450 to 2000, which was an attempt to offer a different military history, a it's much big, it's a big book, a military history in which the West is just one of the players. But I think it's fair to say that the inexorable pressure in publishing of the um, Anglo-American sphere has ensured that we remain dominated by Western paradigms. And the paradigms are of various types. Um, first of all, chronological, the, no the, nature, the idea that there are essentially four periods of warfare ancient, medieval, early modern, late modern, which Western scholars tend to differentiate in terms of their own history, and then try and ascribe the analysis accordingly of the changes from one to another, as if they were consequential, not just for the world as, not just for Europe as a whole, but for the world as a whole. So you see, for example, the thesis that's been advanced of an early modern military revolution advanced uh, by a British scholar in the mid 1950s, Michael Roberts, was then uh, propounded on the global scale in the 1980s as an apparent explanation of changes elsewhere, which, you know, you can debate the rights and wrongs of that. I so happen to think that's a deeply flawed analysis. Other people would not take, would not go that far. But what it does is it reduces agency to non-Western peoples and powers because they are, as it were, presented as effective and as having capability if they borrow from the Western analysis. Now, I think that's really very flawed, very limited and inaccurate. And what I would argue you should really have is to treat military history as an aspect of global studies, an aspect of world studies as a global subject. Now, in treating it as a global subject, that doesn't mean that you necessarily go along with the present conceit which exists um, of so-called decolonization. Decolonization doesn't help you at all in looking at military history because it is, as it were, tries to define it in terms of an ideology of the present day. And much that goes wrong comes when the analytical supposition is, de is defined accordingly. So I've already mentioned the notion of military revolutions. That came from Western progressivist I ideology of the 1960s and 70s and a bit before that, which was then overly easily read into military studies to give a developmental pattern. Now, the problem with the, that standard approach is manifold, but one of the standard problems is the assumption that there is a universal narrative, that this narrative easily establishes what is important, that, that, that what is important is then measured in terms of becoming more modern, that modernity is necessarily more successful than what has come before, and therefore that we give plus points to those who are seen as modernizers and modern, and negative points to those who are seen 
not in that light. Now, when you think about it, I mean, that might sound obvious to some people, but when you think about it, you realize that that is very problematic because the modern itself changes radically. So if we look at, um, well, I mean, obviously Chinese scholars will know that military doctrine and military locating of military thought in China has changed quite considerably in the last 60 years, and they will know that better than me. Um, but that, that is more, of, uh, more obviously the case if you look at things at a global level. So the basic narrative in the uh, 1980s was about uh, confrontation between um, advanced industrial powers deploying nuclear weaponry. That they were seen as the acme, the pivot, uh, the center of the military system. In the 1990s, you start to get a bifurcation. You start to get on the one hand, what are known as war among the peoples, as in the struggle in Rwanda or fighting in Congo. And on the other hand, the American uh, embrace of the so-called revolution in military affairs. And the revolution in military affairs was very much perceived by Western commentators as demonstrated by the campaign at the end of the 2001 that overthrew um, the Taliban in Iraq, and then in 2003 with the rapid conquest of Saddam Hussein's uh, Iraq. And at that point, a lot of commentators saw the modern as defined by um, technologically driven um, warfare and as a very rapid process that, as it were, was quite clear cut in the um, in ascribing capability and then looked to the past for previous revolution in military affairs. And then from the perspective of the United States and, it, and its allies, uh, including Britain, I ought to mention, it all went wrong. Um, the process of, of stabilization, control, whatever term you wish to use, in both Afghanistan and Iraq proved intractable. Um, and in the end, Western forces were evacuated from both with a strong sense of failure. And what this was linked to in the 2000s and the early 2000s and teens was a rethinking of military effectiveness to include much more the question of controlling uh, uh, civilian populations towards much more the question of counterinsurgency warfare and towards defining and developing doctrine, procurement, uh, strategy, operational methods and tactics accordingly. And obviously, as with any change in the military system, people's careers were redefined in terms of how much they or their units were able to embrace that. And, you know, this theory was then taken forward by the episode in Crimea in the mid to teens and the notion of hybrid warfare. And then we move in a different direction in the last few years with the embrace by major powers of very much technologically cutting edge warfare um, and procurement and doctrine accordingly, uh, symbolized by, for example, the interest on the part of the United States, China and Russia in hypersonic warfare. Now, what this demonstrates is that the modern is a changeable feast, that there is no one modern, that the notion of capability based on the modern is very much a changeable and two mission driven, or what I use, the phrase I use is determined by tasking. In other words, if your prime task is let us say, controlling an ocean space, you are more likely much more likely to be concerned with state-of-the-art weaponry because you'll only be dealing with a certain number of weapon systems in that space. Whereas conversely, 
if what you're really concerned about, as many militaries in the world are concerned about, is control within your own country, maybe to your own benefit, the benefit of the political groups you're linked to, and certainly the suppression of counter of insurgency movements. And that is, for example, commonplace in the military history of Latin America or sub-Saharan Africa, then you will have a different set of tasks. And it is not that one is necessarily whatever you would mean by superior or more modern than the other. These are a range of tasks requiring different capabilities and indeed different analyses. Now, the problem is uh, intellectually that we have tended to privilege a set of tasks over another. So particularly when looking at war, we have privileged state to state warfare using whatever is the high tech weaponry of the period above other forms of warfare. Now this is you know, not very helpful. If you want an analysis of military history, it has to work for Germany and the United States, but it also has to work for Madagascar, Peru or Paraguay. And the point is that in most states in the world, um, state to state warfare is not necessarily foremost. If you take South America, for example, the last significant operation in by militaries against other states will leave out the very short term conflict between Argentina and Britain over the Falkland Islands in 1982. But the last one between Latin American states was the Gran Chaco War in uh, between Bolivia and Paraguay from 1932 to 1935. So since 1935, Latin America has not much been concerned. The Brazilians sent uh, forces to help in World War II, to help the Allies, particularly in Italy. But, you know, uh, states such as Chile, Peru, Venezuela, Colombia, uh, have not been fighting each other. Uh, there have been antagonisms, for example, between Chile and Argentina, but they have not led to war. Um, but that does not mean that there is not a military history of Latin America, because if we're thinking of the states, you have had military coups in states like Brazil and Argentina and Chile and governments accordingly. Um, and you have also had counterinsurgency warfare um, in states like Peru and Colombia. So in other words, warfare is much more central to the South American experience than would be suggested if you looked at most histories of war, which tend to leave Latin America or South America out apart from, a, if they include it, a small number of the wars that have been fought between states. So you would get the Grand Chaco War. Before that, you'd get the uh, War of the Pacific in the late 19th century involving um, uh, Chile, Peru, and Bolivia. You'd get the War of the 1860s involving Paraguay, Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina. And you'd get the War of uh, Liberation, Independence, whatever you want to call it, against Spain at the beginning of the century. And that's it, which for a period of 200 years is not very many wars. And on the whole, Latin America is left out. So that's problem number one. It is a very unequal treatment of the world. Problem number two is when you do have areas considered, the analysis of them is often deeply flawed. So let me give you an example, um, India in the 18th century. If you look at textbook after textbook on India in the 18th century, it will refer to one battle the Battle of Plassey uh, in 1757, in which British and British trained forces defeated the army of the Nawab of Bengal and became the dominant power around Calcutta. And that is generally held to signify the superiority of Western military systems, the superiority of volley fire, the superiority of, uh, of infantry tactics, okay? 
And the argument then is made that those Indian powers that tried to copy the Europeans were serious military powers and those that didn't were not. That's the standard approach. It's totally wrong. The biggest battles in India in the 18th century arose from armies invading from Northwest. Number one, the Persian or Iranian army, which defeated the Mughals at Karnal near Delhi in 1739, capturing Delhi subsequently. And number two, the Afghans who defeated the Maharatas in the third battle of Panipat outside Delhi in 1761. These were much larger battles. They demonstrated the significance of cavalry forces um, and yet they get left out because they don't fit the Western paradigm of development. So I'm coming towards a close of my time here before we move to questions. But what I would argue is that in order to understand um, military history, it has to be approached globally. It has to give weight to conflict within states as well as between states. It needs to give due weight to conflict um, in parts of the world other than those uh, of the um, Europeans and Americans or involving them. So, for example, uh, in the 19th century, in scale, the biggest uh, war would have been the Taiping War in the mid 19th century. The biggest war since 1945 is the war in China in the late 40s. People need to consider these and they need to consider how these other conflicts present us with the not just possibility, but with the need to engage in different paradigms of military capability and tasking. And we need to dismantle rather crude progressivist accounts based on Western notions of developmental ideology. Great. Uh, that was surprisingly succinct and to the point uh, for such a, a grand topic. Um, uh, so if people have questions, um, please feel free to uh, enter them into the chat box or use the raise hand function. Um, and I will happily call on anybody um, who may have a question to interact directly with uh, Professor Black here. Um, I guess to, to kick us off then, I think you do a very good job of sort of pointing out the major flaws. Um, I guess my first kind of thought is, is it even possible then to, to fully encapsulate all the things that you've talked about? I mean, it seems like it would such, be such a Herculean task to do so. Well, I mean, obviously I and others have tried to do that and each book that attempts or each lecture course that attempts should be uh, judged on its merits. I mean, I've been trying, for example, on the podcast of the Critic website in Britain to be offering, um, as it were, a complete military history course in that respect. I think it can be done as long as people understand that any account is tentative. One of the great problems is that too many scholars write their books as if there's only one answer, and what a surprise, it's their answer. And those books then get puffed accordingly, or reviewed accordingly. This is absolutely ridiculous. So again, we have a Chinese audience here. You will be well aware that some of the biggest campaigns of World War II occurred in China. Um, and for example, the big 1944-1945 fighting against the Japanese in southern China, Operation Ichigo, um, the uh, fighting in uh, central China in 1942 against the Japanese, and yet these will tend to be left out of books that are supposedly definitive accounts of World War II. Now, what I'm talking about is the same thing at the global scale. I mean, there is an additional complication, which I didn't really um, uh, comment on, which is that one needs in one's analysis to also include how best to tackle and whether to tackle separately both naval and air warfare. Because these are different capabilities which relate to areas in which human beings 
do not naturally operate. So there is the question of how best to consider those. And each of those has a technological dimension, which is not that uh, which is so dominant on land. But having said that, if you look at naval, for example, the standard approach to naval history, and I have written a history of naval warfare, naval power, the standard approach is to look at deep draft weapon vessels taking part in transoceanic operations, uh, which of course was the uh, European norm from the late 15th century onwards. What that underplays is the role of inshore uh, capability, in other words, close to the shore, and the nature of maritime environments, which are uh, rivers, lakes, uh, deltas, and estuaries. So those of you who are Chinese who are listening will know that naval operations on both the Yangtze and the Yellow River were very important in Chinese history and were of a considerable scale, um, as of course also for many powers were what you would call inshore operations, in other words, operations within 50 miles of shorelines, um, which are not those which for which you require deep draft vessels, and in which in many cases, not always, deep draft, that depends on the shallowness of the water, deep draft west vessels are not necessarily effective. And yet it's within 50 miles of the coast uh, that most fishing has taken place historically, that most trade has taken place historically. And if you wish to project naval power against um, coastlines, you obviously have to come in on the whole uh, quite close. And yet that hasn't been the dimension that tends to be put to the fore. Right. Um... And do you want to talk about air air warfare a little bit as well? Yes, I mean, in the and I've done a separate book on air power. In the case of air warfare, you have um, a standard narrative, um, you know, sort of development, World War One, interwar air power theory, uh, World War Two, which tends to focus attention. And then post-war use of air power, both unsuccessfully, Americans in Vietnam, and maybe more successfully elsewhere. Advantages and disadvantage. Well, big disadvantage is so many books on air power leave out where air power is often most effective in combat terms, which is warfare at sea. Because again, there is only so many uh, targets to engage with. If you can suppress those targets, you've actually are in a much stronger position. So, you, you know, I deliberately on the cover of my air power book put an aircraft carrier. Uh, in fact, a Japanese illustration of a Japanese aircraft carrier, because I wanted to make the point that it wasn't just a European or a European and American uh, monopoly. Second of all, and linked to that, there is a fascination with certain types of use of air power for combat uh, and for conflict, not others. So transport aircraft tend to be underplayed. Um, the use of air power for, um, for uh, close support of troops tends to be underplayed because most air power theorists are interested in air power as an independent arm. And then linked to that, and this is a debate that would be understood in many parts of the world, there is the question of whether air power is a separate strategic arm or is at best an operational means that could be used for uh, to, to help armies and navies. And I would tend towards the latter interpretation. Clearly, air power is changing in its characteristics now through the development of combat drones. Uh, but the interesting thing about combat drones is they exemplify the extent to which uh, air power is an adjunct of existing force structures, particularly army force structures, rather than necessarily being an independent arm of its own. Great. Um, I do see a question in the chat box, but it's a very broad and vague question, which is, what is your perspective on the Han Chinese on Han China? Um, maybe the person who asked that, if you could sort of specify a little bit more. Oh, about I mean, I, I no, 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 I don't mind. I mean, first of all, they can read what I've said in the in my book, my new book. 
Um, I find hand china is very interesting. It's usually counterpointed with um, the classic Roman Empire of that period. I think those are both, that's a, um, a helpful approach, although of course there is a greater degree of ethnic cohesion to the Han Chinese Empire than there was uh, to the Roman Empire. And then as far as China itself is um, concerned, and China remained a formidable military power into the close of the 18th century. Uh, so well after the Han period. Um, and, you know, by origin, I'm an 18th centuryist. And in the 18th century, um, China um, was able to operate successfully um, in Tibet, in Sinkien, in Mongolia. Uh, in the late 17th century, it had driven the Russians out of the Amur Valley. Uh, Chinese forces uh, power projected into Taiwan. They went further west into Central Asia than China does today. And there were one or two failures. There was failure in Burma, in the or Myanmar in the late 1760s, and in Tonkin, Vietnam in the late 1780s. But by the standards of any world power, uh, the Chinese are doing better than anybody else. I mean, if you think about it, compared to that, the British failure in North America to suppress the American War of Independence is much more serious and severe. And if you think about it, um, if you're looking at the very end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, um, Berlin falls to the French in 1806, uh, Amsterdam has fallen to them in 1795, Madrid falls to them in 1808, Moscow briefly falls to them in 1812, and in turn, Paris falls to attack in both 1814 and 1815. Um, China itself um, remains um, in control of its core area until uh, the conflicts um, with Western powers from the late 1830s onwards. And that is a extraordinary achievement. And if you're looking at the uh, infrastructure of Chinese military power, um, it's generally agreed that the infrastructure, the um, support networks, uh, the deployment of force that uh, took Chinese forces forward um, towards and into Central Asia were extraordinary achievements. So I would say China is a very major military power um, into the beginning of the 19th century. Um, it then has a period of um, grave difficulty, part of which relates to internal tensions and divisions. As I've already mentioned, the Taiping Civil War is a very serious civil war in the mid 19th century. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the boxer, uh, pro, the boxer movement is another, is another period of weakening as is the warlord period. Um, uh, but th what is interesting is if you look at the war between China and Japan um, in the late 1930s, early 1940s, what is really interesting is the resilience that China shows. I mean, you know, if you think about it, the Japanese initially did very well. They capture major Chinese centers of population. Beijing, Shanghai, Nanjing, Guangzhou. Uh, they defeat the divisions of the Central Army, which is the really core force. But what the Japanese have failed sufficiently to appreciate is what I think is an absolutely crucial lesson in warfare, that warfare is about outcome, not output. Output is killing people. Output is winning specific battles. Output is taking particular territories. But outcome is getting your opponent to accept your will and to stop, stop fighting. And the Japanese totally and utterly failed to do that in China. And I think this is a very, well, absolutely crucial episode in world history.
B, if Hitler had had any sense, and he didn't, um, he would have understood from that the folly of his attacking the Soviet Union in 1941. Because again, capturing territory, killing a lot of Soviets did not mean that they were going to stop fighting. So there is this broader question of the feasibility of tasks in light of the political context that exists. And I think that's a very, very, very significant one when you're looking at global military history as a whole, but also, um, you know, Chinese history as well as other histories. Great, that's very, very good insight. Um, I see that someone has raised their hand, Amy. Um, hi, Professor. Thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation. So I have read a book about Chinese history. And in that book, um, the author raises an idea that um, sometimes ancient China started wars against foreign nations in order to solve the problem of overpopulation within the country. And I find this idea very different to my common sense. So I would like to ask you, um, whether you find this idea true in other parts of the world? Well, uh, I myself do not see that as a factor. People go to war for a whole host of reasons, and I've written a book called War and Its Causes. People go to war for a whole host of reasons. Some of those reasons you might say are clear cut, they leave a trace in the archives. There has been a, uh, as it were, a memorandum, a council meeting, cabinet discussion in which people make clear why they have done things. In other cases, you have scholars, commentators, extrapolating, imposing, or analyzing the situation in order to try and explain things. So let's start with number one. Um, why do people usually go to war? Well, historically, they've usually gone to war for both defensive and offensive reasons. The two are not always completely separate, but there is a big difference between them. Defensive factors, you feel yourself under threat or you are indeed under attack in some respect or other, and you respond. Um, to the other power, you may be acting in an aggressive fashion, but the key thing is you think you're acting defensively. Separately, act uh, explicitly acting for aggressive purposes. Now, that can be to spread an ideology which you believe needs to be spread, a religion, for example. It can be in order to seize land or material goods, uh, and in seizing land in the past, often providing an aristocracy with more territory. So for example, the Anglo-Norman and baronage sort of conquering Wales in the 12th century is a, um, you know, and, in, in, uh, uh, and into the 13th century is an instance of that. Um, I, I do not find the argument about population pressure necessarily helpful. It has been argued that that was one of the reasons why there was support for expansion in Manchuria in Japan in the early 1930s. But I would argue that insofar as the Japanese were after resources, it was more that they were after coal. I mean, Japan was resource poor, Manchuria was resource rich. Uh, it also was a continuation of the Japanese pattern at that period of expansionism in East Asia, they'd already conquered Korea, for example. Uh, and I would also suggest that it reflected tensions within the Japanese military, uh, with some groups being keen on conquest and others not. Uh, I wouldn't say that there was anybody sitting there in some bunker saying, right, we've got population pressure, which Japan definitely did have, let us do X as a result. So I would say you often have to slow up things and think about things much more in the specific decisions made at that particular moment. But I agree with you entirely, looking at the tasks of why people set out to um, embrace a conflict helps to explain the factors that motivated them and therefore how they measured success 
in that particular conflict. So thank you, Amy. Great. Uh, there's a couple more questions in the chat box. Uh, this one coming from Tom Hawk. I don't know if you guys want to ask directly, um, but th the question pertains to if you could offer some sort of framework for understanding the potential uh, Russia and Ukraine conflicts. <laughs> well, I mean, there's all sorts of frameworks you can argue on. So you can certainly look at a framework politically um, in which you have two very different um, political drives. Um, uh, President Putin's idea of dominating a sort of near Russia and trying um, to recreate what he sees as the essentials of Russian strength versus a Ukrainian sense of national identity and wishing for sovereignty. So the political element is very clear. In military terms, Russia very much um, dominates the situation. Um, and it's a little difficult to see whether if it re reached a full-scale war, it would be anything other than a relatively speedy uh, outcome. On the other hand, from the Russian point of view, that would leave them with the need to maintain a relatively costly, in terms of the manpower, um, occupation force in Ukraine. And I'm not sure whether in broader strategic terms that's what they want to do or not. I think they would like to absorb Ukraine. I don't think they want a long-term conflict. And I think that's a, an interesting dichotomy there for them. It seems people are, are kind of interested in particular wars here. Um, so somebody asked uh, if you could give a quick evaluation or analysis of the Korean War in the 1950s. Uh, well, often they have interest in particular wars because they want to write an essay about it. Korean War, 1950 to 53, arose, I would say, from the instability in the Korean Peninsula, of which, which, uh, which sort of was a product of the end of empire. In the case of empire there, it's Japanese empire. The end of empire means that you get what you see in a lot of post-imperial episodes, which is struggles between forces. So you've got that in Angola after the Portuguese left. In the case of Korea, you've got one, which, one side which, as it were, uh, looks to the Soviet Union and the other side which looks to, we're talking here of the late 40s, uh, the other side which looks to the United States, low-level conflict, a degree of territorial stabilization derived from the occupation of Korea between Soviet forces and American forces at the end of the war. This spins out of control, this low-level conflict in 1950, because the North perceives an advantage, an opportunity. It is militarily much stronger. There is no doubt it is encouraged by Stalin, the Soviet leader, who wishes to put pressure on the West and sees this as an opportunity to do so. Um, the American response is much stronger um, than the North and Stalin had anticipated. Um, Stalin doesn't want to go to full-scale conflict uh, with the United States, and he leans quite hard on Mao Zedong uh, for have Chinese participation. Um, um, and the Chinese government understands that that's also in its interests because it doesn't want American forces on the Yalu River on its more immediate border, and because there is still a process in 1950 um, of the, as it were, the last stages of the Chinese Civil War, um, the, the uh, Chinese Communist forces taking Hain, um, the island of Hainan, for example. And this seems to be a aspect of that. So you have Chinese intervention that pushes back the American, the UN forces in the north, and you then end up with a 
uh, a situation of quite incessant conflict in Central Korea, much of it of sort of World War I type conflict uh, between entrenched forces, a lot of artillery, not much mobility or maneuverability. And that goes on till 53, when the new American government, the government of Dwight Eisenhower, wishes to disengage from full scale war uh, and tries to negotiate it effectively with the with the North Koreans. Um, and um, it also offers the threat that if, it, if there isn't uh, a armistice, it will use nuclear weapons. And that leads to an uneasy armistice in the Korean War, which in a sense is what's lasted till the present day. My book on the Cold War, I think, would be of interest to people because in my book on the Cold War, what I do is put much more emphasis on the Cold War in Asia, whereas, as you, as you will know, the conventional account of the Cold War is very Berlin-centred, as it were. I don't think that's helpful. I think that from the uh, late 1850s onwards, so in other words, the Arrow War plus the Russian occupation of the Amur Valley, uh, you know, the foundation of Vladivostok in 1860, uh, Western occupation of Beijing in 1860. I think from then onwards, there was really incessant conflict or confrontation in East Asia uh, on the Pacific littoral until the China-Vietnam War at the end of the 70s. So I think that you need to link the conflicts of the eight, late 1850s to the end of the Taiping War, to the Sino-Japanese um, uh, War of the 1890s, to the Russian-Japanese War of the 1900s, um, to growing uh, Japanese presence in the Far East on, on the mainland, including participation in the Russian Civil War in the late, and intervention in China in the late 19-teens, early 20s, to the uh, short, small-scale um, Manchuria uh, Russia War, Soviet Union War of 1929, to the Japanese moving into Manchuria in 1931 and the conflict that continued to 45, um, to the Chinese Civil War, to the Korean War, to the wars in Indochina and then Vietnam, and then um, you culminate with the wars after the Americans left Vietnam, the conflict in Cambodia and the China-Vietnam border war. And what I would argue is all of these are incredibly important in military history. They're incredibly important in international relations, and they tend to be very seriously downplayed because of the focus on Europe. I mean, what is hilarious about military history is so much of the time people spend focusing on losers. What, I, as I wrote in an essay once, what is the point of writing at great length about Napoleon? Napoleon failed. What is the point of writing at great length about Germany? G Germany lost World War I and lost World War II. It is much more consequential to look at the major powers and the two major powers in the world at the present moment of China and the United States, and to consider their military history, their strategic uh, geography, their particular type of military tasking, their individually distinctive patterns, but also the extent to which they both help to construct, exemplify and reflect more general tendencies in the history of war. That's really interesting. I, I'm fascinated to know why do you think there is this sort of obsession with the losers of the war? Well, I think, first of all, there is this Eurocentricity. I mean, you know, you look at a book like Michael Howard's or, more, or uh, actually a much more egregious example, an unnecessary example. If you look at Martin Van Crefeld's study of logistics, which was the major study, I, I'd like to think my replacement is better, but we, others can make their mind up of that. Crefeld's study of logistics went from uh, the... Uh, the sort of French revolutionary Napoleonic system, essentially, he had a little bit earlier on Europe, essentially up to the end of World War II. 
It was essentially European centered. He didn't manage to consider China or Japan or India states that you would really think worth bothering about. And I think you could say the same about most of Michael Howard's writing. So it's not surprising that they focus on these European struggles. There's the endless obsession with the Germans. Um, um, there's been writing on this, a number of American scholars have written on the American fascination with the Wehrmacht. Um, the, uh, in the same thing though, you get in American history towards the Civil War. I mean, what's interesting about the Civil War is the Union success. That's the most interesting thing. A lot of people though, prefer to focus on the Confederate failure. Um, and again, I don't think that's tremendously helpful at understanding things, not least because when you look at the loser, you tend to adopt the loser's point of view. In fact, it's interesting. People will always tell you history is written by the winner. It isn't. The winner doesn't need to write history. They've won. They're actually running the show. The people that are invested in writing history are the losers because they want to justify themselves. They want to say, oh, it wasn't our fault. You know, we were really better, but we were out-resourced or we were unlucky. You know, the sort of we were out-resourced, the Confederate view of American Civil War or the German view of World War II. Actually, no, the Germans were out-fought. You know, that's the key element of it. Um, but obviously, it's much easier for them to take a different perspective. And there were also specific reasons. I mean, the American planners, for example, during the Cold War wanted to take the view that maybe the Wehrmacht, if it hadn't been run by Hitler, could have actually beaten the Soviet Union, because that suggested that maybe they could beat the Soviet Union. Um, actually, no. I mean, the major problem um, with German... Uh, fighting quality is the gap between it and the Soviets was never as great as they like to think. In fact, from day one of Operation Barbarossa, the Germans were losing more troops and armor than they'd anticipated. Two, um, the German military, not just Hitler, the German military didn't know how to plan. And linked to that, three, it's the output and outcome thing. They had no real way of gauging how you mean move from operational style victory, we will create this pocket of our opponents around Kiev and force them to surrender, to outcome, we will obtain our strategic goal, they will surrender. They had no idea about that. Mm -hmm. So fascinating. Um, I think this relates pretty well to one of the other questions in the chat box, which is um, how do we implement learning of military history so that it's not limited to such singular perspectives, especially a westernized one? Well, I think that's a very good question. Um, what I would say is, first of all, I think there's a tremendous value in different national traditions and, as it were, presenting those broader than that of just simply the history of the armed forces of those countries, but looking at um, individual strategic geographies, individual political uh, focuses, and producing work that can then be integrated at a global level. Second, and linked to that, in order to do your own military history well, you need to understand the points of views of others. So classic problem for the United States engaging in say Iraq or Afghanistan, or for, the, for that matter, the Germans engaging against in Yugoslavia um, in an occupation was just not understanding that there were different perspectives, not understanding that, that you cannot force your equations of victory and defeat, suffering and loss. You know, they've lost 20 men, we've only lost two men, therefore we've won. Well, actually, no, not if they're prepared to take that loss of 20 men and keep fighting. So you need to have a broader cultural pattern of understanding in order to make sense of your own military history. Now we're coming up to a close, obviously in time terms. I don't want to just simply say to people, you ought to read my books. I mean, I would like to think people would read them, I think the important thing is that any author, and I've tried to do this, should look at a multiplicity of foci, 
but also should try and decenter their military history. So, you know, I've done specific books just on the 18th century, just on the 17th century, just on the period 1450 to 1600. And I've tried to go in for what I call decentered military history, to not have the view that there is one paradigm, one explanation, one narrative that you need to study. So to, to take up that very last question, the best way to understand it is to understand there is no one answer, that all of history is an interim report, that you do your best to provide as good an account that you can at the moment, but you are aware that issues of the present day, and it was one of your speakers that raised the question of Russia versus Ukraine, will affect public interest and actually the anal analytical constructions that are used. So therefore you have to understand that the historical analysis, like war itself, is a plastic changing, endlessly remolded philosophy and not something that is fixed in any one account. I've tried to do as well as I can. Other people offer differing accounts it's important to realize that there is a variety. And if you are looking for quality in analysis, it's the person that tells you that there are different ways that are do to do this is the person worth paying attention to. Thank you very much. My greetings to everybody. I hope you get a chance to read my stuff and don't hesitate to ask me to be on again. Thank you. Fascinating, thank you so much. That I couldn't have thought of a better way to end that. Um, thank you so much. Um, we have a tradition uh, at our events, which is we ask everybody to uh, turn on their camera so we can take a group photo. Um, and so if people could uh, smile and turn on their cameras so that we can all take a group photo, uh, that would be great. And then at the same time, I'm going to unmute um, everybody so that you guys can all thank Professor Jeremy Black by, um, for yourself. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for joining thank us you, again. Professor Black. Um, thank you. Thank and you. all the very best to everybody. Cheers then. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.